lost my place. Give me just a minute until I find it. chapter 35. Exodus chapter 35. I was looking at the wrong... I read the chapter here and looked at the other side of my Bible. I'm like, that's not what it's supposed to say. <laughs> you ever done that before? No. I'm going to read verses... Uh, just, just verses 1 through 3 to begin our text and, and to set a context this evening and I just want to look at a, a simple um, 35, 35, Exodus 35, and we'll read verses 1 through 3, and we'll look at a, just a, a simple principle this evening like we usually do on Sunday nights, and uh, try to glean something that will just help us with our mindset and our thoughts. You know, it isn't always knowing what's right, it's just sometimes just knowing the attitude to have about being right. And I, I, I learned as a, as a child, hopefully from my parents and from teachers, that um, being right with the wrong attitude uh, was not acceptable. And, uh, you know, um, sometimes I think we do things just with the wrong attitude. It's interesting. Uh, we'll, we'll get there. I'll get ahead of myself. Chapter, chapter 35, verse 1. The Bible says, And Moses gathered all the congregation of the children together, <clears throat> said unto them, these are the words which the Lord hath commanded, that you should do them. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. Let's pray. So Father, as we look this evening at attitude yeah I just pray that you would help us to be able to, to discern to glean understanding that would help us we pray in Jesus name amen I just want to look this evening uh, really about that about the matter of of an attitude uh, and you know attitudes everything attitudes everything you know wanting to do something makes a big difference in it getting done just generally speaking, just an attitude, uh, we could say, comes from a desire, from a desire within a person. And an attitude's a choice. So uh, that's something a lot of times, you know, uh, that we don't, we don't acknowledge to the degree that we should. Uh, oftentimes we think that there are some things in life that we just don't have a choice about. Uh, one of those is, is attitude, and it's the attitude that we have. You realize that all of us have feelings. Everybody does, right? To some degree, everybody feels a certain way. Now, now some folks are um, they're less feeling than others, less sensitive than others with regard to feelings. In general, that can be good, and sometimes, sometimes it can uh, be bad. But we all do have feelings. We all feel a certain way. Um, we could say our feelings, we feel good or we feel bad. And you say, well, you know, what do you mean about feelings? Well, you just get feels about things. And you know your feelings affect your attitude, the way you feel. And uh, some of the times your feelings are a response to things that are facts, uh, and sometimes they're a response to things that aren't facts, okay? For instance, if um, you get run over in the parking lot and some things get broken on you, the fact is, is that you won't be feeling well. Okay, that's a fact. Right? It's not debatable. Um, anybody who's ever been injured or hurt knows that when you don't feel well, um, s sometimes you don't know why, but you get run over the parking lot and you survive it, but you'll, you'll feel it regardless, depending on what you run over by. Whether it's Susanna or the bus will make a little bit of a difference. I got ran over by Susanna just a little bit ago, and I'm doing all right. But uh, the bus, now that would be a little bit different. And it would affect how I feel, and how I feel would affect my attitude. Wouldn't it, to some degree? Now, the fact is, though, I may not feel good, but that doesn't mean I can have a bad attitude. 
And that's where we get confused sometimes. Sometimes we, we don't feel good, so we think it's okay um, to have the wrong attitude. Now, attitude's a word that's used by uh, <coughs> sailors and pilots. Uh, it's, a, it's an angle or, or a vector or direction. Uh, if you're flying an airplane, uh, one of the first things you do when you take off is, you know, it depends on what type of plane. Sometimes you have a, you know, you have a flaps adjuster down here, you have a flap adjuster up here, and uh, you set your attitude of your plane because the plane will always be climbing or, uh, or descending, one or the other, until you adjust the attitude. When it's in the right attitude, then it's level, it flies level. And so if you ever fly in a, in a small plane, you, it's kind of scary flying a small plane the first time just because... You know, most small planes <laughs> that most people get to fly in are, you know, from the 1940s or so. <laughs> and, you know, they kind of look at sometimes, even if they're in tip-top shape and safe and all that, they're just, you know, they just haven't advanced very much. And, I mean, they, they have in some, and those are even more frightening to me because the more things that can fail in them. But, you know, when you set the attitude of the plane, what you're trying for is to just get it to fly steady. Or if you're you're going to be making an approach, you know, sometime and you're pre, you're flying pretty high, then you want to set your attitude for a slow decline. But you never want the plane to have an attitude like this or like this. You want it to be steady. You want it to be stable. Uh, same thing uh, when you're sailing. You know, a lot of times in sailing, you know, you have to you have to make use of the winds. And there's different winds. You could have a you could be sailing downwind, or you could be uh, have an attack and sail in, into the wind, cross winds, and the attitude of the sail and the attitude of the boat to the wind makes a difference in your trajectory. And so, I don't want to make too much out of it, but the way uh, we feel, first of all, affects our attitude, uh, but it's not okay to be affected. In other words, it's natural, I should say, for the way we feel to affect our attitude but it's not okay to have the wrong attitude, right? Uh, there are seasons for things, there are times for things, but there are just seasons and times. Could we say that a bad attitude is an attitude that you shouldn't have? Bad attitude is an attitude that you shouldn't have. And uh, it's tough to define a bad attitude exactly, but it's an inappropriate one, one that's not appropriate for the time or for the situation. So, um, it's important for us to discern. You know, I don't feel like whatever, but my feelings shouldn't determine whether I'm going upward or downward. They sure they shouldn't determine my attitude. In other words, my attitude ought to be like this, shouldn't it? For a Christian, it just ought to be vertical. You know, we ought to be, be we ought to be climbing. We ought to be, our trajectory ought to be ought to be upward. And I'm just explaining these things in terms that I hope for just to help you with the thought process in it. And so I have to do this a lot of times. I have to say, you know, I don't like my attitude. <laughs> or not just I don't like my attitude, but I have a bad attitude. And I just have to fix it. I have to say, you know, wrong attitude. And you know what I found out? I found out that oftentimes feelings catch up with your attitude. I'm going to have a good attitude, and pretty soon I start feeling good. Mm -hmm. They do, you know. In other words... What's backward is letting your feeling affect your at, affect your attitude instead of your attitude affecting your feeling. There are some things that I seldom feel like doing, but when I do them, I enjoy them. Now, you can look at my yard and tell I don't enjoy yard work very much right now. So, but when I do it, I kind of enjoy it, I guess, you know, when it gets doing it. You ever get, get into a project and it's just so daunting at the outset that you just don't even want to begin it? But once you get to doing it, then after it, when you start getting toward, you know, making some progress and seeing some things, all of a sudden you're just kind of enjoying it. And it uh, becomes an enjoyable project. You think, you know, I'm glad I did this. I, I should do it more. And again, you don't do something because you feel like you do it because you're supposed to. When you do what you're supposed to, then you feel like it. And uh, I wanted you to just see something about Israel. Israel, uh, well, let me just ask you, let's just quiz you a little bit about national Israel. There, there, this is not a trick quiz tonight like mostly they are. Uh, this is one where I just like some input so that I know that we're all kind of on the same page and, and moving in the same direction. Could you give me some high points for Israel as a nation? Could you give me some high points for Israel as a nation? 
Just, just name, name some. Yeah, Andrew. Um, what the, what the, uh, what, what God found out loud, the, uh, the pharaoh, the pharaoh and the army to uh, drown in the Red Sea. Okay, that that was a high point, I guess. They, they, they sang Anyone a song. Didn't they? Okay, uh, Mrs. Dons. Uh, David was anointed king. When David was anointed king, yeah, pretty high point, yeah. Uh, Mrs. Price. Um, the temple when the. Spirit of the Lord moved in the temple. Yeah, when the Spirit of God moved in, that's really in our context here this evening. What? Maybe when they returned from Babylon and started. Oh, the yeah, when they were, you know, when the foundation of the new temple was laid. Yeah. And when the walls were rebuilt. Yeah, that's my point. Snake raised on the pole. You know, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. That's an important one. When yes, they, Patty? When they won wars. Okay, after they won wars, they always danced. You know, remember the. Uh, Saul has slain his thousands and David has slain his ten thousands. And then after David had won a battle and he was dancing in the streets and Michael or Michelle, however you like to say your name, uh, you know, kind of despised him because he said he was, you know, looking like a child or a fool, you know, out there, you know, acting the fool, dancing around. But yeah, so that would be a high point. Yeah. It's interesting. That's one where because of the wrong attitude, uh, time of rejoicing really became... <laughs> Kind of, you know, it came it became a marked point of a bad beginning of things that are bad in her life. John Solomon de dedicated the temple. Yeah, when Solomon dedicated the temple, and yeah, I think Miss Price said that when the Spirit of God came in. Yeah, that's that was a high point in national Israel. What about a season or time in Israel? What would be the glory days for Israel? Yeah, pretty much Solomon's reign, right? Right in that transition from Sol David to Solomon. Really, the, diff, the time frame between David and Rehoboam would probably be glory days. And that's kind of where we're at this evening. We're in, um, well, that's not where we're at right here. We will be there in just a little bit. But uh, that's where we're going uh, here this evening. But here we are after, uh, you know, God's kind of given the, the law to, to Moses. And um, Moses has gathered the congregation and, he is about to take, they're about to prepare for building uh, a tabernacle and for being able to have a place for God uh, to, to be able to go in and, and uh, have access to God. And I just want to look at the attitude that the people responded. And first of all, it's interesting It's interesting to me, the reason I read, the, read our text, even though it's not really where we'll be at this evening, the reason I read it is because it's really interesting to me. Uh, verse 2, Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doth doeth work therein shall be put to death. Now, I, this is an area where the wrong attitude makes something that's really great something really terrible. In teen Sunday school this morning, we, we uh, talked about the Sabbath day, and I said, supposing you worked a job where you are offered... Uh, to be able to take a day off or two days off, and to have the income for those days just like you did more or just like you worked. As long as you didn't work, you could take the day off, and uh, you could you could be paid for it. So, how, how many of you like to have an employer that said, you know, I don't want any moonlighting. I don't want anybody working on the side. But so here's what I'm going to do. I want to pay you for a five day week, but I want you to work four days so long as you don't work on the fifth day. Huh? Yeah. Okay, that's good. That's what the Sabbath day is. That's what the Sabbath day is. God knows that it's good for man to rest. He made man, made him with a need for rest. And God said, I don't want you to work on the Sabbath day. And I'll bless you so that you'll be just like you. Uh, you'll be better off than if you'd worked. Mm. That's, that's the promise of it. Mm. And I just have to say, that's a good thing. Isn't it? You know, it got even better uh, when Christ established the church and really the Lord's Day, day of worship got established. It went from a six-day week to a five-day week. Five-day week is a Christian concept because then you got the day of worship. So instead of working, you can worship. So you have Sabbath day, and then instead of working on Sunday, you can worship. And... Um, it's a matter of faith that worship thing is because you go from having six days of income to five days of income. And guess who's going to make up the difference? God does. You know, my whole life I've never worked Sundays. I've never worked on it. Well, it's not true. 
I've worked for probably the past 18 years every single Sunday. <laughs> but uh, the fact is, my job is on Sunday it has to do with worship, worshiping the Lord. I've never worked a job that isn't worship on Sundays, ever. I've just flat refused because I've just claimed that promise. You know what? God will take care of me if I commit and am faithful to Him about it. And God always has. And that's a good thing, isn't it? Isn't it great? Now, if I didn't, I'd just work an extra day and not have anything more for it. That's all the difference is. You don't take the Sabbath, you're just going to work and you're not going to have as much. You're just going to have a lack. But here in our context, Moses said, if any person works on the Sabbath day, they're going to be put to death. Well, that kind of is a deceleration, isn't it? That goes from things being really up to really down, doesn't it? I mean, it just goes from, you know, it's really a good thing to the, all of a sudden the Sabbath's a bad thing. You know how you approach a thing really has a lot to do with it being good or bad. You take a truth of God's Word and you embrace it and it'll bless your heart. Any, any truth. You take a commandment from the Lord and you obey it and it'll bless your heart. You disobey it and it'll cause you no end of misery. And there's just a principle there about attitude, isn't there? I just see it. You know, you look at this and, and as I read it, how many of you kind of get a little bit afraid there? If you work on the Sabbath day, whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. You know, it's like taking a bunch of kids to Chuck E. Cheese and saying, have fun, or you're dead. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Take all the kids to, what's that jumping place that they, that they like to go? The Sky Zone. Sky Zone. Take the kids to Sky Zone and say, have a good time, or it's the end of the road for you, buddy. You know? Well, I'd be willing to have a good time. <laughs> you know? But the fact of the matter is, Sky Zone's fun without a threat, isn't it? Without a negative consequence. What makes the difference? Attitude. And attitude's a choice. Have a good time, <coughs> or have bad consequences. And that's really the Christian life. I'm not trying to, uh, trying to frighten anybody with anything here, or threaten anybody with anything. That isn't the point this evening. What I'm saying is, is that it's either drudgery or it's joy. Living for God is either drudgery or it's joy. Now I'll tell you, God's plan is for it to be joy because that's what He made you for. But if you don't want to do it God's way, it would be pretty miserable. I have tried to do things for young people before that have just decided they're not going to be happy. Just, they've got a bad attitude and you just try to do it. It doesn't matter what you do. You do their very favorite thing. Who want to do it? No fun. They'll find something to complain about. They've got a bad attitude. You ever seen it? You ever done that? Huh. I'm not going to be happy. You can't make me be happy. I care what you're doing. Man, people, they, people cater to you and they do everything that you like and you know, and, and you, you almost accidentally have a good time in spite of yourself, but then you, you know, come back to your senses and realize I'm not going to have fun, and you just ruin it. Because that's what you're going to do. And again, it's a bad attitude. Okay. Now we've established that. We've looked at that, just that principle. And, uh, and I just want to read this story. Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it. This is verse 5. An offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen, goat's hair and ram skin dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood and oil for the light, spice for anointing oil and sweet incense and onyx stones and stones we set for thee, Father, the breastplate and every wise heart among you shall come and make all the Lord hath commanded. Okay, so he said make an offering. Now what's the difference between uh, an offering and a tithe? Free will. Yeah, an offering is something you do because you want to. Offering is something you do because you want to. By the way, um, the tithe is never abolished in the Bible. It's never abolished in the Bible. But the emphasis in the New Testament is offering, not tithe. It's grace. And uh, not requirement, not law. It's just every time the, in the New Testament the Bible talks about giving, it uses the word give, and he uses the word offering. So you can give a tithe, you can give an offering, 
but really the, the idea of offering is, is the emphasis. And the quantity of giving is what you purpose in your heart. So every man according to his he purpose in his heart, so let him give. And then attitude, not grudgingly, or of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful attitude. So the emphasis in the New Testament is what you want to give cheerfully. And the word cheerful is a synonym for the word cheerful. There is the word hilarious. Giddy. Like, ha, 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 ha. You know? Um, <laughs> I don't go there. But I imagine people in casinos, you know? I'm about to, I'm about to uh, give away my... <laughs> I'm about to spend my last dime. Yeah! <laughs> you know? So yank that one arm band and spin it hard. Right? Just, I mean, just kind of like, woohoo! Uh, we're probably going to go broke! Woohoo! You know? Uh, let's just have a good time, you know, uh, while we're doing it. In other words, but the way that we're supposed to give to the Lord is cheerfully in that sense. In other words, just real glad to do it. And uh, you ever had something that somebody gave you that they didn't want to? Yeah. You, you can't really get anything worse than that, can you? Just give it back. Um, I am not the church. So when you give to the church, you don't give to me. But as a member of this church, I just assume you didn't give anything you didn't want to. Uh, I'm not going to sit around and worry about what we don't have because you didn't give. So it's just it's just misery to have something that isn't given cheerfully, God's way. That's all there is to it. Uh, you've never you've never heard this pastor tell you what to give. Never had me say you need to give. Uh, it's an opportunity to give. It's an opportunity, sort of like uh, the Sabbath day is an opportunity. In other words, you get a day off and you get God's blessing. You give you, you God gives you the grace to be able to do something that's beyond your ability, and you get God's blessing in your life. And blessing is in kind, isn't it? So you give financially, you'll have financial blessing. You give your time, you'll have a time blessing. Uh, you, you, whatever it is, it's in, it's in kind. And uh, I, just, I, uh, I was just thinking about our year that's coming up and thinking about our uh, business meeting this evening. I'm just asking the question, you know, we've had 2018's been a been a marvelous year. It really has it's been a good, been a good year in our church. I've seen uh, I've seen folks in our church grow, and I've, I I think that a lot of a lot of the folks in our church are at a place they weren't at the beginning of this year. It's been a good year uh, as far as it goes. People have been saved, and uh, lives have been affected. And it's it's been fantastic. I want next year to be better. Like next year to be better. And the question is. How do you make a year better? Well, you get more out of, out of your church. In other words, we get more out of us. I'm not talking about financially. Mm -hmm. I'm not just talking about time. I'm just talking about we just we give it more. We put more in it. That's how we get more out of it. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I can't ask for more. I, sometimes I think about the folks in our church that are doing things. I could ask more from folks that are doing less. But whenever I ask for more, it's the folks that are already doing everything that do the more that do more. And uh, you know, as I could, I couldn't in good conscience ask folks that are doing everything to do more. Just couldn't do it. Uh, but if you want to, you can. <laughs> you know, if, if uh, that's the attitude. Yeah, I'm not asking you to want to. I, I'm not trying to be manipulative or figure out a way to say the same thing a different way and not come out and say it. I'm not trying to do that. See, I'm just saying, if you want to, you can. In other words, you can have more of God's blessing. You could uh, you could give to God uh, more. Let's go to go to chapter thirty six, and um, look at verse three. The Bible says they received of Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought from the work of the service of the sanctuary to make it withal, and they brought yet unto him free offerings every morning, and. Um, Verse four, and all the wise men, um, and all the wise men that wrought all the work of the sanctuary came every man from the work which they made. And verse five, and they spake unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. Uh, 
And Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing, for the stuff that they had was sufficient for all the work to make it, and too much. Restrained. I mean, it's like an idea of putting them in restraints. Or Hanka, stop giving. That's enough. Enough already. Too much of a good thing. This is sort of, in our day, what I would would liken it to. If you work for a good company that cares about its reputation and it really cares about, actually legitimately does care about its employees, one of the things a good company is concerned about is, first of all, people advancing. You know, in other words, not keeping people in a low place, but keeping people moving up. And then another thing that, that a good company cares about is people being in good shape when they can't work anymore, retirement, that sort of things. And a good company, uh, it, it, with good management, you know, you realize that you're going to be a good company, you've got to have good people, and to have good people, you've got to treat them well. And to treat them well, you've got to make sure that they're taken good care of. And so a lot of times they have matching programs for people to save for the retirement. And they say, well, if you, you, know, if you come, if you give. And I, I have uh, I've known of companies which will match whatever you put toward your retirement. That can get out of hand, though. In other words, you're trying to give an incentive to get things started, but then there are people like Lee Riffle, they'd give 100%, you know. <laughs> He'd get a second job, live on that, and give his 100% to that, whatever it is. Uh, you know, you ever see somebody's trying to encourage people to give, and they do a matching thing, and they, but they only do it up to certain, they, they want to motivate you to do something. And here the motivation is, hey, give a free will offering with, out of love to God. And people started doing it, and they realized it's really fun. I and mean, they got addicted to it. And they started doing it so much that Moses said, "Okay, you've got to cut it off now. That's too much, you know. You only, only we only need so much." And uh, I look at that as far as Israel goes, and as far as Moses goes, I look at that as a real high point in the nation of Israel. I look. You ever look back on times and you just say, "You know, those were good days. Those were good times. <clears throat> These were good times in Israel, where people were giving." Free will offering. Why? Because they wanted to. Nobody was forcing them to. Nobody was saying, you know, I gave this much. You know what you give and trying to, trying to guilt people into things. It was do it because you want to. And people started doing it and they realized this is a pretty good time. And it started really happening. And that's the way giving is. You know, to him that, uh, him that, uh, what is it, giveth, they, they uh, had nothing left, or what is it? Nothing left over, and there's whatever the person that, then they have no lack. Oh, well, I'm, I'm messing up the quotation of Scripture. It's Sunday night, so the hope of getting it straight is not very good. Okay, that's the first text we want to look at this evening. Let's go to one more. Go over to First Chronicles chapter 29. I told you we would try to go there. <coughs> and I just want to read verses 1 through 9. Okay. Uh, Chapter 29 of 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. I'll start reading in verse 1. You can kind of skim around and catch up if you have gotten there. Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great. For the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God the gold, for things to be made of gold and silver, for things of silver and brass, for things of brass, the iron for things of iron and wood for things of wood, onyx stones and stones to be set, glistering stones and of divers colors and all manner of precious stones and marble stones in abundance. Moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of my God, I have of mine own proper good of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. Even 3,000 talents of gold. 3,000 talents of gold. Mm. I mean, we're talking about uh, somebody a couple weeks ago said that uh, all the gold in the world would fit in this room. Well, that's probably not accurate according <laughs> to this. Uh, no, there's this is a lot of gold. Um, and 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the house with all. The gold for the things of gold and the silver for the things of silver and for all manner of work to be made by the hands of artificers. 
And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? So here's David saying, I saved all my life so I can give this to God. That's pretty neat, isn't it? In other words, David had it in his heart. He wanted to build the temple. But uh, God didn't allow him to do it because he was a man of war. And so he was left to his son Solomon as the great thing that Solomon did. And actually, that was Solomon's crowning accomplishment or achievement in uh, his kingdom was the building of the temple. That was the greatest thing that Solomon was responsible for accomplishing. Even though everything Solomon did was out and way beyond what had been done up to that point, the crowning achievement in Solomon's uh, kingdom was, during his reign was the building of the temple. And David prepared him for that by saving all this. Now look at verse 6. Then the chief of the fathers and princes of the tribes of Israel and the captains of thousands and of hundreds with the rulers of the king's work offered willingly. And the Bible says, and gave for the servants service of the house of God of gold 5,000 talents and 10,000 drams and of silver 10,000 talents and of brass 18,000 talents and 100,000 talents of iron and they with whom precious stones were found gave them to the treasure of the house of the Lord by the hand of Jehiel the Gershonite. Then notice verse 9. Then the people rejoiced for that they had offered will that they offered willingly because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord and David the king also rejoiced with great joy. Rejoicing with great joy. I'd like that to be our theme for 2019. Rejoicing with great joy. I would like 20... Did I say 2018? 19. 19. I hope I said 2019. I'd like 2019 to be a rejoicing with great joy year. Rejoicing with great joy. And as I look at the scripture and I look at what makes us have joy, I have to look at the one who made us and what his word says. And what I find is a theme. There are a lot of things that are commandments in the Bible. And one of the things we're commanded to is rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. But the question about it is how? How? Well, you have to have the right attitude. How? Well, you have to do the things that help you have the right attitude. And here we find is David kicked it all off. You know, if you look at what David gave in comparison, he gave 3,000 talents of gold. And in verse 7, the combination of everybody in um, Israel, they gave 5,000 talents. So David the king gave, you know, he gave 3,000 and they gave 5,000. So they gave a little bit more than him, but almost single-handedly he gave almost as much as the entire nation did. And that was a good example for everyone. I think leader, that's a good example for leadership. I don't think a, a good leader ever asks more of people than what he himself gives. That you say, hey, you know, give more. Now we understand proportion and giving, don't we? When we look, see Jesus at the treasury and we see the widow who threw in her might and, and uh, Jesus said she's given more than everything because she gave everything she had. She gave it all. And so she was the biggest giver. God understands. God weighs and measures the heart. Certainly David would have been probably the premier giver in national Israel. He would have been the guy that would have taken more and a greater proportion in spoils of war than anyone else. He would have been a guy to whom tribute or tax would be paid. He would, he would have been the guy that had the most. But I think probably David did not have in proportion to what he gave to everyone else what he had. But he set a good example of giving, and the result was that it was contagious. A good attitude's contagious. A good attitude's contagious. A good leader uh, does more than he expects people to do. And a good attitude is brought about, <laughs> we see here, by just giving willingly. Giving willingly. And I think that I'd like to have. 2018, I'd like to at the end of the year, or not 2018, I'd like to at the end of 2019 say rejoicing with great joy was kind of the theme of our year. I'd like a joyful year, wouldn't you? I want one. And so um, I believe that the Holy Spirit of God would have us 
to be working on that, and I believe this is a good way uh, to understand or to kick it off. And verse 9 of First Chronicles 29, then the people rejoiced for that. And that's, a, that's a, an explanation. The reason they rejoiced is that they offered willingly, because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. Okay, so that's a, that's a, a related principle. When you offer willingly, you're not offering to pastor. You're not offering to the church. You're offering to the Lord. And then the Bible says um, that, and David the king also rejoiced with great joy. And the result is that you bring joy all around you. And a good attitude can be, a bad attitude can be contagious, but so can a good attitude. And the result of the way the people gave can you imagine David having a bad attitude about this? He could have, probably. He could have said, I gave 3,000 talents of gold, and the entire nation gave five. Come on, guys. Seriously? No. David said, man, this is wonderful what everybody... See, he gave it to the Lord. And so he wasn't comparing himself with anybody else. He just... He was just... He had a lot, and he gave a lot. I suspect, and I don't know this entirely, I know David left his children... Uh, well established, but I suspect that David gave mostly everything he had to the house of the Lord. I think he gave, I think he gave, did, I don't think he left his children rich, I think he left the house of the Lord rich. And that's pretty neat. <coughs> and um, the result of it was that the people modeled the attitude of their king. They said, well, we want to do that too. And they did, and it just, it made David rejoice. And there's a principle there, rejoicing with great joy. And I'd like us to have it. It all happens when we begin by saying, you know something, I want to have the right attitude. I want to have an attitude of rejoicing. And the way to do it is to have a willing heart. Father, please help us to have a willing heart. And God, what we offer you this year, help us just to offer it just straight to you. Not with a go-between, not trying to impress any person or having a reward of men, but having a reward of you. And we pray that you be pleased by it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, in just a couple of minutes, we'll have our uh, members' business meeting. Let's say it's uh, seven. It's 5 till 7, let's say, at uh, 7.03, we'll have our business meeting. Is that right? Okay. That'd be All right. You're dismissed. Preacher? Yes. Uh, 3,000 3, talents.